last time we met, I talked a little bit about the consequences of what happens when good people don't stand up to discount and work against injustices. And we talked about a story of Kamtsu, Bar Kamtsu, a legend in the, in, in, in the Talmud, and, this, and the circumstances surrounding the destruction of the Second Temple. And I talked a little bit of our responsibility, that we need to stand up. We need to be the hero. We need to be the one that says, no, I won't allow this to happen. Today, I want to start off today's discussion by talking about a fellow in the Bible. Might not be the most popular and the most common fellow in the Bible, but he did something, stood up where no one else stood up. And what he did was he challenged us. He gave us a moral dilemma of what we need to do. And today I'd like to follow that kind of a discussion. I'm talking about several verses in the book of Numbers, specifically chapter 25, starting with verse number 10. What happened here, the Jewish people are on their way to conquer the land of Israel. At that time, the indigenous people were the Canaanites. And God had promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that one day the Jewish people will be foreigners in the land of Egypt, but eventually God will take them out and he will lead them to the, to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And the Jews were in Egypt for an, several hundred years when finally Moses came and he took them out and he was leading them on a charge to enter and to conquer the land of Israel and to establish a Jewish commonwealth, the first Jewish commonwealth there in the land of Canaan. Along the, along the way in the desert, a number of different instance, instances took place. But as the Jews were getting closer and closer, the indigenous people, the folk that were living around Israel, saw the Jews coming and were afraid. Two most powerful kings, Sichon and Og, tried to challenge Moses and said, you will not go through here. Even though Moses had sent a peace party in their direction and said, listen, we have no beef with you. We don't want anything. We don't want to fight with you. We have nothing against you. Let us pass. But they wouldn't let the Jewish people pass. And Moses was forced to pick up arms and destroy these two kingdoms, Sichon and Og. When the Moabites saw that the Jewish people had destroyed these two powerful kings, and Moab was way weaker than either Sichon or Og, they began to fear. They became fretful. They said, look at this. A swarm of people are going to invade our land, and they're going to steal it from us. So the king of Moab, Balak was his name, got up and called for a sorcerer, a magician, a Gentile prophet, a pagan prophet by the name of Bilaam. We know him because Bilaam and his donkey in the story, very famous, and the donkey speaks to him. And Bilaam is employed, is encouraged, is asked, is petitioned to curse the Jewish people. And by cursing them, we Balak had hoped to stop this rampage and to stop their incursion into his country. But Bilaam was unsuccessful. Bilaam had told Balak a number of times, my friend, I am not in charge. I don't make the rules. God makes the rules. If God wants me to bless the Jewish people, I will bless them. If God wants me to curse them, I will curse them. And time and time again, Bilaam, instead of cursing the Jewish people as he was asked to do, actually blessed the Jewish people. And finally, Bullock, in frustration, said to him, you could have had anything. I was willing to pay you a king's ransom, but God had denied you the honor which is due to you. And they left. And then Bilaam came up with an ingenious plan. And he said, you want to hurt these people? I know that their God hates, hates promiscuity. He hates. He loves family purity. He loves when husband and wife are together and there's no outside playing around. So what you do is send your daughters to seduce the Jewish soldiers and this way God will become angry with the Jewish people and through this way once God is angry you will then be able to hurt them and they won't come and capture your, your land. And that's what the Moabite and the Midianite women did. They went out and they found the Jewish soldiers and invited them into their tents and they, they played around with them and they actually got them to worship idols, to commit idolatry. And a plague ensued and 24,000 of the Jewish soldiers had died. How did the plague end? And here's where we're getting to the crux of the, of the issue. There was a fellow by the name of Pinchas, or Phineas as he's called in the Bible. Phineas was the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron. 
He was Aaron's grandson, a grandnephew of Moses. And he had come to Moses and said, Moses, a terrible thing just happened. One of the leaders of the Simon tribe had taken to him a pagan wife, a pagan woman into his tent and he's having relations with her. What should be done? And Moses said, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know. So fin Phineas says, I think I'm going to take matters in my own hands. And he took a sword and he went into the tent of that Simonite leader and he slew both him and that pagan woman. And by slaying them, by actually killing them, the plague had stopped. And now we pick it up at, on, on chapter 25, verse number 10. And the Bible says like this, God spoke to Moses saying, Phinehas, the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron, the high priest, turn back my wrath from upon the children of Israel, when he zealously avenged me among them, so I did not consume the children of Israel in my vengeance. What did, what did Phinehas do? By an act of violence, by actually killing two people, he stopped the plague. Now, what Phinehas also did, but I don't think he was thinking about that at that time, is caused to us a moral dilemma. What do we do here? We see a plague that is surrounding us. People are dying. Now, the only way to stop this plague in your own mind is to do another act of violence, to take two people and to slay them. What do you do? Pinchas understood that he has to take action. And he took matters in his own hands. This is called vigilantism. In America, it is illegal to take matters in your own hands. We have a police force, we have security personnel, you have to go to them and they will carry out justice. But you can't do that. You have no right to do that. But Pinchas did that. He picked up his sword, he walked into the tent of the Simon tribal leader and he slew him and the woman that was with him at that time. Many of the people at that time, leaders of the other, other tribes, criticized Pinchas for his actions. They said, look at him, who are you to do this? And there was a dilemma. Was Pinchas right or was Pinchas not right? Should he have picked up his arm, uh, arms and slay that person or should he have not picked up arms and to slay that person? And we were confused. But God all of a sudden appears to Moses and to Pinchas and to Elazar, his father. And he says, my friends, I know that Pinchas caused a moral dilemma. And I know what, do we should, what should we do? Can we do this? Is it right? What lesson is there for us? But only Pinchas, of all of the people throughout that entire region, of all of the people surrounding Moses' tent, of all of the people living within the midst of the Jewish camp at that time, it was Phineas and only Phineas that picked up the sword and turned away my vengeance because I hate promiscuity. And only he understood that. And for that, he was right. And then God blesses him. And he said, therefore, behold, I give him my covenant of peace. And isn't that interesting? My friends, think about this for a moment, what God says. Behold, I give him my covenant of peace to someone that has just done a violent act. What is his reward? His reward is the covenant of peace. It's very strange. Usually in a battlefield we give a silver star, a medal of honor, a purple heart, but a covenant of peace for a violent act? Why would God designate that blessing onto Phineas versus any other blessing? And I think the reason is, is because Phineas in his own life probably had a moral dilemma. He thought to himself, did I do something right? Two people are dead because of my action. Two people that I could have taken them to court, could have prosecuted them, got a verdict, and let court take matters in their hands. But I didn't do that. I stood up and I slay them. Then he went back to his tent and he began to twist and turn in the night. And he said, did I do right? Should I have done that? I don't know. I stopped a plague, but two people are dead. He was in turmoil, my friends. He was hurting, my friends. He needed peace of mind. And that's why God said to him, my friend Phineas, you should know that even though two people are dead, you are receiving my blessing of the covenant of peace. Because it was only because of you 
because of your actions, because of your standing up and not thinking too much, but actually going into the tent and taking care of business, that I turned away my vengeance and other innocent people didn't have to die because of what you did. But he threw a very great dilemma into our faces. What do we do? Today, my friends, as you well know, are battling a, a word called terrorism. People that believe that by causing and by blowing up innocent people, they're going to achieve a certain goal that they set out to do. And I think probably that they think that they are correct, that they're on God's side, they're doing God's will. And how do we react to that? What is our reaction? People, good people sitting in the United States, people sitting in Europe, people sitting all over the world. What would Phineas have done? How can we say to ourselves that we need to pick up arms and to somehow slay somebody before they do anything in order to avert a great tragedy? Vigilantism. Right or wrong? Should you do that if you know? Well, I think it's quite clear that if you understand that a crime is going to be committed, if you know that someone is going to be murdered, you have every right, and not only a right, but a responsibility to pick up arms and to take action in your own hands to avert the death of an innocent person. I think that is quite clear. But, it, but the real way to understand whether one is doing right or one is doing wrong is looking into our heart. What is really the motivating factor? And what is the track record of the person? Is this person a madman? Does this person have a personal agenda? Did Phineas have a personal agenda here? What was he looking for? Did he have something against the tribal leaders of Simon? Was there enmity before then? Or was this purely a selfless act of Phineas laying down his life in order to stop this trend? I believe that is, the, that is really the crux and the essence of the question. Who was Phineas? Well, if God hadn't intervened, we would still be debating. Did he do right? Did he do wrong? Was he good? Was he bad? But since God came in and revealed himself, and he testified himself, God Almighty came down and said, Phineas did something correct. That tells us there's no question on Phineas's actions. That his intent was completely pure. And we need to know for ourselves, when we face that kind of a situation, where we have to take matters in our own hands, ask yourself this question. Is it because there's enmity? Is there a problem between you and the perpetrator? Is this something that is going to work if for your self-aggrandizement? Or are you doing this out of selflessness and you don't want anything out of it? Your motives are pure. If your motives are pure, if you understand quite clearly, and there's a very fine line, you have to be smart. You have to understand, and you have to know through and through what your motivating factors are. Then you can take action in your own hands. But, but if you convince yourself that you are taking matters in your own hands because you love to see your face on the camera, you want to be the headliner of the 6 o'clock news, and ABC, CBS, and NBC will all talk about you because you stood up and took matters in your own hands. No, that's not Phineas. Phineas worried. Phineas turned and twisted. He himself was in the moral dilemma. And only because God Almighty came down to us and revealed to us his true motivating factor, that's why God blessed them with the covenant of peace. Because he told them, my friend, you have nothing to worry about. You did a great thing. If we had an opportunity early on to kill Adolf Hitler in the 20s, it would have been a tremendous thing. Someone would have garnered God's blessing. And no one would have said, wow, look at this, a act of violence, a terrible thing. No, my friend, that act itself would have saved the lives of 50 million innocent people. And those kind of people must be taken down before they're able to involve and to act upon their evil desires. Because no, make no mistake, we live in a multicultural society. And of course, everybody has to be treated with respect. But there are rights and there are wrongs. And we need to understand that. We need to know that there are good people and there are people out there that only want our destruction. An evil intent 
if we're able to ascertain that, if we're able to understand that, and our motives are pure, we need to take out that evil. We need to uproot that evil. By uprooting that evil, and sometimes through violence, yes, sometimes through violence, what we do is we save the lives of tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of innocent people. We walk a fine line when we talk about vigilanteism. We like to applaud. Remember the story of Bernie Getz in the New York subway system when he was being mugged and he stood up and he shot four people who were trying to mug him? Most of us applauded him. If we didn't do that openly, we certainly did that behind closed doors. He was a hero, Bernie Getz. He stood up. He stood up for the average guy in the subway that was fearful, that was terrified that by these terrorists who came into the subway to accost them. We loved it, but we walk a very fine line. Do we want to go back to the Wild West where everybody carries a gun and, 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 and takes matters in their own hands? I don't think so. But I think that there are times during our lifetime and there are situations where we can make a difference and we have to make a difference. Maybe it's not going all the way to violence. Maybe it's not resorting to violence. Maybe we can stop the situation and avert a terrible tragedy by just saying something or doing something. And we have to do that. But in order to make sure that we are blessed with the covenant of peace, we need to know that our intentions, our motives are pure and not tainted by some, some self-aggrandizement and some self-delusional agenda that we have. It's a very difficult question, but I think that Phineas showed us the way that once in a while you need to stand up. But Mokam She'enish, in a place where there is no man, you need to strive to be a man. And how did he get to this position? Do you know how, my friends? because he was trained early on to know that he needs to do something. The easiest thing is to sit back and do nothing. You don't need any training for that. You sit in the big seat, you sit back, you twiddle your thumbs, you don't bother anybody, nobody bothers you. But at the end, you're not going to get the reward. Later on in the portion, what happens is, Moses talks to the Lord. It's at the end of his life, and as God had spoken to him and said, you are not going to lead the Jewish people into the land of Israel. I'm sorry, you're not going to be the one. And Moses says to God, dear God, and I quote from chapter number 28, verse number 15, 27, verse number 15, I'm sorry. Moses spoke to God and he said, God, of the spirits of all flesh, you who know everybody, Appoint a man over the assembly. I'm going to die, but I want you to appoint another great leader who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall take them out and bring them in. Someone that understands that the community is made up of different people and not one shoe doesn't fit everybody, but everybody has to be dealt with differently. A great leader is not someone that looks at everybody the same, that everybody is 5 foot 10 and weighs 195 pounds. No. That's not a great leader. A great leader is someone like Moses who understands that everybody is an individual and everybody has in needs. And all of those needs have to be dealt with in different terms. Some need to be dealt with strongly and some need to be dealt with kindly and some need to be dealt with many times over and some need to be dealt with only once. So you, Lord, he asks him, please appoint someone who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall take them and bring them in. And let the assembly of God not be like sheep that have no shepherd. Even though he was passing away, even though he was going to die and not lead the Jewish people into the land of Israel, he still worried about them. Even to his last living breath, he worried about his people, his flock. One of the great commentators on the Bible made notice why it keeps saying who shall go out and come in, who shall take them and bring them in. Why all of this double talk? Why do we need to, this re, to, 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 to reinforce this over and over again? Because what Moses was really saying to God is, God, please, don't do to the next leader what you did to me. What did God do to Moses? And Moses says, remember, way back when in the beginning of Exodus, when we introduced this character called Moses in the Bible, Moses is approached by God and God says to Moses, Moses, I want you to take the Jewish people out of Egypt. What's Moses' reaction? Come on, God, you got to be kidding. Are you nuts? I'm, me? 
Of all of the people in the whole wide world, you gotta pick me? Look at me. I'm not a great speaker, and I don't have any type of history, and I don't have any, I don't, I, I'm not fit for the job. Look at my resume. I'm, I don't know how to take people out of Egypt. What, what am I gonna talk to, to Pharaoh? I'm a shepherd here. But God comes back over and over and back to him again and says, no, Moses, I want you. I want you to be the guy to go down to Pharaoh. And Moses keeps saying, no, 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 it's not me, God. You want somebody else. You want my brother Aaron. You want to get a guy, a big guy, someone that can really impose a presence in front of Pharaoh. Look at me. I'm a stutter. I'm a nobody. I don't want, I don't want to go. And seven days gone, for seven days, you kept insisting, no, you and only you. And I kept saying, no, 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 until finally you convinced me. Yes, you convinced me to leave my house, my great place where I lived, my wife and my children. I went down to Pharaoh and I went down to him because of one reason, God. And you know why? Because you convinced me that you want to take the Jewish people out and you want to bring them to the land of milk and honey, to the land of Israel. And I agreed even though my resume didn't look like I was going to be the leader. I actually had no experience in getting people out of slavery. Thank you very much. But I did it because I hoped that I'm going to be the one that's actually going to see this to fruition. But I'm not. And you took that away from me. So don't do that to the next leader, God. Don't seduce him with promises and say, you know what, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And at the very last moment, snatch it out from under him. Please, treat him better. Now, who was Moses talking about over here? Who was he referring to that God should appoint over the flock? You know who he was talking about? His two sons. Moses had two sons, Eleazar and Gershon, that were born to him before he went down to Egypt. And he said, listen, you know, now it's time to worry about my family. That's what people do. You know, they build up and at the end of their days, they have to take care of their children. And that's what Moses was doing. He said, now it's time, you know, everybody got, Aaron's children are taken care of, this guy's children are taken care of, now I gotta take care of my family. I gotta take care of my two sons. And God says to him in the next verse, God says to Moses, my friend, take to yourself Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom there is spirit, and lean your hand upon him, and he becomes the next leader. Oh my gosh. What does God tell Moses? That he should take Joshua the son of Nun, not his own two sons, not his biological sons, not Elazar or Gershom and make them the leader, but somebody else, a stranger, a foreigner, Joshua. Why Joshua? Because as it says in the good book, he who tends to the fig tree shall eat its fruits. King Solomon says that in one of the great books. He who takes care of the fig tree will eat of its fruits. What, why do I mention that? Because God said, who was the one, Moses, that when you came in the morning to your tent to judge the people and to teach them the words of the book, who was the one that was there every single morning setting up the benches? Was it Gershon? Was it Elazar, your two sons? No, it was not. Who was it? It was Joshua. Who was there late at night when you left and everybody left and cleaned up the place? Put the benches back, the books back, the scrolls back, cleaned up the place for the next day. Was it your two sons? No, it was not. It was Joshua. Who, was sta who stood at the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights while you were up here and I was teaching you the words of the book? Was it your two sons that followed you? No, it was not. It was Joshua. Joshua tended the fig tree. He cared about you. He listened to you. He absorbed what you had to say. He never left your side for a moment during the 40 years in the desert that you walked around with the Jewish people back and forth and back and forth and all of their travails and their tribulations and all of their stories. One man was there standing next to you and that was Joshua, the son of Nun. It was not Gershom. It was not Elazar. It was not your two sons. And therefore I say to you, Moses, he becomes the next leader, not your children. That, mo that hurt Moses, I'm sure, but it did not hurt him enough not to be able to give his splendor and, to, and his judgment over to Joshua. And he placed his hands and made Joshua the next leader. What is the lesson? What do we learn from this? You know what it is? It's great 
to have a great father. It's great to have a wonderful, famous, successful grandfather. Oh, it's so good. And what do most of us do when we have a grandfather and a successful father? We tend to sit back and relax. Dad is going to take care of it. Don't worry about it. What do I got to struggle for? What do I got to sweat? What do I have to go through the turmoil for? Dad will take care of it. Papa, you know what PhD stands for? Papa has dough. I'll get my PhD, don't worry. My dad is rich and powerful. I'll get a, I have a PhD, I don't need to worry. Go to college. Dad will take care of everything for me. I don't have to worry. You are not going to get the spoils. But if someone realizes that they have a great father like Moses, what should they have done? They should have been the first ones in the morning to the house of study. They should have been at his side day after day understanding that even though he was the greatest of the greats, the prophet of all prophets, the one, only one that God says about him, that he was like a buddy to me. Face to face I spoke to Moses. They should have understood that they have the responsibility to get up in the morning and to strive and to study and to succeed. Then, and only then, they might have been able to stand in their father's shoes. But not while your father is working hard and he's struggling and he goes down there and what do you do? You sit by the meadows and you watch the boats go by. You sit at the dock of the bay wasting your time. You'll never be successful doing that. So my friends, when you read this part of the Bible, when you read this chapter, please take to heart the idea of hard work, of striving and being successful. It's easier. I do admit, when we have a springboard like a father like Moses, who will take us in and have protection and, 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 and come from that kind of a family that understands the importance. But even if you don't, those who tend to the fig tree will eat from its fruits. That is a very important lesson that we need to learn. Thank you very much. And until next time, God bless you and have a wonderful day. Hashem, but I'm so excited to be here with you.